Think back to your very first game console, whatever that was. What are some of the things you remember about the experience? Well, I'm going to bet that a big part of it was the media and packaging of the games themselves, which for a long time was unique to every system on the market. Opening and playing a game was a tactile and console-defining experience of its own. Today I want to share a little ode to the cartridges, discs, cards, and the packaging that came with them, especially now that Sony and Microsoft seem to be doing their best to get us to stop buying and playing games that way. As we go, watch for my top 10 list of the best media and packaging designs of all time, as well as a couple of the worst. First, let me just say that I'm limiting this video to game consoles, but I could and may make an entire series of videos just on physical media. Computers, video and audio equipment all have physical formats that invoke nostalgia and in many cases are still more useful than digital downloads or streaming. But doing everything all at once would make for a very long video, and honestly I wouldn't even have time to shoot or edit it before life kicked back in for me and work got in the way. I'm also limiting this to more or less standard designs for each system, and designs from the US since that's what I know. Obviously limited and special editions sometimes do their own thing. We'll start with a little bit of history. The Magnavox Odyssey is generally credited as the first ever game console that used removable cartridges. While not fully programmable, the system would play different games depending on which cartridge you had inserted. The Fairchild Channel F then took that a step further by making the system fully programmable, with the games stored on the cartridges themselves rather than in the system's ROM. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System at your larger JCPenney. The home entertainment system that never gets old. Plug in a new video cart and change the fun. Play tic-tac-toe, shooting gallery, or just doodle. Switch video carts and play Desert Fox. These two systems set the early standard for how games actually worked on consoles, and they made it a viable business. Games came on cartridges you could buy separately, enabling a continuing revenue stream long after a system was sold. It's important to remember that this was not always the case. Ah, the cartridge. Attention shoppers. The new Atari cartridge game is in. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh-oh. George again. <laughs> in the early days of the game console and even some computers, these hunks of plastic contained all the gaming goodness you could stand in a self-contained black rectangular box. In truth, we all knew that inside them was a separate printed circuit board for every game we played, which somehow just made them seem even cooler. Every manufacturer had their own cartridge design, because after all, these were one of the parts of the system you interacted with most, not to mention the main way to keep your system feeling fresh over the years, by buying new ones. So unique but standardized designs quickly became part of any system's branding. We gamers then would actually argue over who had the best cartridges. Not just the best games, mind you, although we argued over that too, but who had the coolest looking, most easily stackable, and most satisfying to handle little bricks of fun. I didn't own an Odyssey, but I did own a Coleco Telstar Arcade a weird 1976 game system that used triangular cartridges to fit its overall pyramidal look. Pyramidal? Is that a word? Pyramidal. Anyway, it was a big brown pyramid. I honestly sometimes forget that this was my first actual game console. I didn't spend a lot of time with it, so I usually bestow that honor in my memory to the Intellivision. But I do remember those goofy triangle cartridges. Cartridges and their packaging would remain one of any system's defining elements for at least the next couple decades. From the boxy Atari VCS carts in their simple glued together boxes, to the wedge shaped Intellivision games in their gatefold packaging with plastic sleeves, then later to the more rounded designs in plastic clamshell boxes of some NES games and nearly all Genesis and Mega Drive releases, cartridges and packaging designs evolved along with the systems themselves. And when system manufacturers switched over to using more standardized discs, first based around CD-ROM specs, then later DVD, and finally Blu-ray, the packaging often remained distinctive, albeit sometimes a bit more problematic. Along the way, various oddball systems tried to reimagine what physical media should look like, from the Pioneer LaserActive's LaserDisc, to the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16's Who Cards, and the similar media from Sega for its SG-1000 and then Master System, 
to the GameCube's mini DVDs, to the PSP's UMD format that makes it the only handheld to ever run optical discs. So let's take a look at some of my favorite media and packaging designs. Here's that top 10. And keep in mind as I run the specs along the screen that in most cases, cartridge capacities are limited more by cost at the time than by technical limitations. Bank switching and other techniques often mean there is no hard maximum game size. Only optical discs have a real fixed limit. Modern homebrews for classic systems often blow right past the limits manufacturers originally set. Anyway, here we go. Number 10, the Atari 5200. The 5200 followed the hugely successful VCS-2600 and was based on the company's own 8-bit computer line. But as with everything about the 5200, Atari apparently decided that bigger was better, and even with the same code, 5200 cartridges looked nothing like Atari computer cartridges. The company gave the new system's carts a distinctive corrugated look, built-in overlay storage, a completely protected PCB including the edge connector, and a unique silver and blue label color scheme that matched the rest of the system's branding. The cartridges had a nice heft, making a satisfying clunk when inserted into the system. Points off for the lack of a top label for when inserted in a system or stacked on a shelf, and an oddly slippery finish that made stacking them next to you like playing a game of Jenga. The boxes continued with the silver and blue color scheme, although they were no less flimsy than the standard 2600 and 7800 boxes that were glued shut, meaning some amount of destruction was required to open them. If you were careful enough, though, you could theoretically use the cereal box-like flap at the top to reclose them, though most people didn't seem to realize this and just tore the boxes open before throwing them away. My own anecdotal evidence for this is that as the second owner of all of my 5200 games except one, every single one of those games is missing the box. I bought this boxed one on eBay just for this video, and yes, it was new and sealed, and I opened it. <laughs> Believe it or not, new old stock 5200 games are neither rare nor expensive. Number 9, Atari 2600 and 7800. Well, we're getting all the Atari systems on the list out of the way early here. This entry marks both the 5200's predecessor and successor, included here as a single entry because they share the exact same cartridge design. The 2600 was the first truly mainstream game console, selling 29 million units, and as a result, it really set the standard for what people expected from their game cartridges. 2600 carts had a flat top and back that made them easy to stack, a front and top label to make it easy to identify games no matter what the situation, and a satisfying feel in the hand. They went through a bunch of label branding schemes, some more interesting than others, while the 7800 had just two, silver and red with full color printing and silver and black. Pole Position 2, the pack-in game, was printed in white and black. It was apparently the only one. The boxes for 2600 games were originally color-coded, and the very first ones came in gatefold boxes, though I don't have any of these. Atari themselves seemed to forget what the color code meant after about 1977 and pretty quickly dropped it. Eventually they went to silver and red, then just dark red, while the 7800 took over the silver and red scheme but with larger cover art. The 2600's boxes were mostly glued, although later ones produced during the 7800 era had regular unglued top and bottom flaps, as did 7800 games too. Atari really seemed to make an effort at consistent branding, but even not accounting for third parties, it still felt a little like the Wild West, with different label and box designs being changed, updated, reverted, and overlapping constantly. They were sort of the Microsoft of the 1970s and 80s game console industry. Number 8, the Nintendo 64. At a time when its competitors were all switching to optical-based media, Nintendo said, sorry, wrong, and stuck with cartridges specifically for their faster data access and shorter load times. In other words, they did it for us, so good on you, Nintendo. Even if it did result in more expensive games with less texture storage than the PlayStation or Saturn, but I digress. Oh, and they called these cartridges Game Packs, and they didn't even spell that properly, but we won't get into Nintendo's alternate reality universe here. The N64's cartridges feel like solid chunks of hard plastic carved out of a plastic quarry. They're super sturdy. Most of them had big, bright, colorful labels, although not on top, but you can actually buy these separately now, which is an interesting development. 
Their curved top design matches the look of the system perfectly, and it's unmistakable which console they're for even from a mile away. The boxes themselves vary between the US and Japan, as packaging often did on Japanese systems, with US boxes being somewhat flimsy cardboard that at least could be opened via a regular flap, no glue. Still, many of these have not survived to today simply because of how thin the cardboard was, and it's vastly more common to see loose cartridges than boxed ones on the used market. Japan got ironically larger boxes with a plastic insert that held its shape better. Probably the only console I can think of with bigger game packaging in Japan. Number 7. The Mattel Intellivision While Atari set the mainstream public's expectations for what game cartridges and their packaging should look like, Mattel's biggest contribution to physical media was to popularize packaging that was meant to not be thrown away. It was common in those days to see nothing but loose games in any 2600 owner's collection, and you still see that today if you ever visit a retro game store. But Mattel wanted you to collect and store your games in the boxes they came in. Originally, Intellivision games shipped in gatefold boxes with a storage pocket for the instructions and controller overlays, and a plastic insert on the other side for the cartridge itself. Opening an Intellivision game was kind of an moment every time, like opening a little treasure chest. Over time, cost cuts meant that first the plastic insert went away, then the gatefold design itself. Later Intellivision games shipped in boxes very similar to the worst Atari packaging. The cartridges themselves had a wedge-shaped label edge, necessary to see the name of the game when a cartridge was inserted in the system. They were smaller and lighter than Atari games despite having better graphics and sound, but they didn't stack all that well. If you were sitting down to play a bunch of games on a Sunday morning, as I often did, it was a better option to stack your games in their boxes, like Mattel intended. Number 6. The Nintendo Famicom Yes, just the Famicom, not the NES, which had cartridges that were too big and came in flimsy boxes without any system theming that most people threw away, though they did have these cool slipcases. But the Famicom had smaller cartridges that I'd almost call cute somehow, and they were bright and colorful, not just the black of most cartridges to that point, or the uniform gray of their US counterpart. There was no real standard for the packaging, which meant that some Famicom carts came in crappy cardboard while others, like these early Namco games, came in heavy-duty plastic clamshells that clearly influenced Sega's packaging for the Master System and Genesis. But they were a lot smaller, making them easier to store. If all Famicom games came like this, the system would be higher on the list. It's only where it is because package design was just anarchy, with every man for himself. Number 5. The Sony PSP I admit that this is here in part because of how weird it is, a handheld game system that plays optical discs. But just look at how cool they are. There's no other format like this, and while it was a complete one-off, it's a pretty popular one-off, with the PSP having sold about 80 million units worldwide. Still not enough to topple Nintendo as the dominant handheld maker. These little powerhouse discs could store 1.8 gigabytes of data even more than the GameCube, and that's a home system from the same era. Surprisingly, while even car CD players were notorious for skipping and just bumping your PS2 could cause a game to error out, the PSP's mechanism seemed exceedingly reliable, and even today it seems that the vast majority of them still work fine, with the system's only real trouble spot being the battery. Sony was the driving force behind Minidisc, so they had a lot of experience in making reliable, portable optical disc players. UMD discs also came in plastic clamshell cases that were smaller but heavier weight than a DVD case. They just felt like quality, without taking up undue space on a shelf. There are people who really don't like UMDs and think optical discs with their load times and their moving parts have no place in a handheld. But I think this is just one of the coolest formats out there, and with the perfect packaging for modern collectors. Number 4. The Neo Geo AES Neo Geo cartridges are almost legendary, even among those who have never held one in their hands. The Neo Geo AES was literally a Neo Geo arcade machine repackaged for home use, and its cartridges were barely redesigned full Neo Geo MVS cartridges originally made for the arcade. They're massive, and heavy too, with a look that screams, I am for hardcore gamers only. SNK was famous for its 330 megabit claim for the maximum game size, 
but that was in fact more than doubled later in the platform's life. That's around 41 megabytes, by the way. This was an insane amount of cartridge storage for a home system in 1990. Compare it to the Sega Genesis's and Super Nintendo's 4 megabytes of cartridge ROM. Of course, Neo Geo cartridges cost hundreds of dollars with all those memory chips in there, so they'd better be protected with a hard plastic clamshell case, and they were. Are you worthy of owning and playing a Neo Geo AES cartridge? I had a system for a while and decided that I was not. I sold mine some time ago, having only managed to collect one game for it. Even now, they don't sell for cheap. Number 3. Nintendo GameCube's Japanese Releases There really is a lot of Nintendo on this list, isn't there? The GameCube used optical discs that are pretty accurately described as mini-DVDs. They use the same storage format, but are just physically cut down so they can hold 1.5 gigabytes as opposed to 4.7 gigabytes. Why did Nintendo do this instead of just using standard DVDs? Well, mainly for copy protection, although this only lasted about as long as the system stayed on the market before people found a way around it. But I guess that means it worked. The smaller discs also probably made for a smaller system, with the GameCube-compatible Panasonic Q showing how big the GameCube probably would have had to be if it had used full-sized discs. Those smaller discs also made for smaller packaging, which meant more games could fit on a given set of shelves, whether in a home or store. That had become increasingly important in Japan by this time, where the proliferation of video games and the burgeoning collector market had meant that both stores and individual people were literally running out of room. If you've never been to Japan, just realize that most urban apartments are just a single room, and most stores aren't much bigger. So Nintendo designed GameCube games and the plastic boxes they came in to be small, and then they put them in nice cardboard slipcases for a little extra style and panache. Unfortunately, in the US we got the same size discs, but game boxes that were actually bigger than a standard DVD case, which is just weird and unnecessary. They still have a quality feel, but they're bigger than they need to be. Number 2. The Sega Mega Drive and Genesis Okay, yes, the Master System used the same clamshell cases as the later Genesis, and it's that clamshell packaging that's the real star here. But I'm giving this one to the Genesis because of its more exciting artwork style and its more refined cartridges. Sega wasn't the first company to use plastic clamshells, but they were the first to really push that as the standard game packaging for a mainstream system. If you bought a Sega game in the early years of the Genesis, you were basically guaranteed that it would come in one of these, along with a big, sometimes really big, user's manual, and often a poster for the system. This isn't my original copy of Sonic 2, but I do remember this game coming with a whole bunch of stuff when I bought it new the day of its release. That gave Genesis games a feeling of quality and expense. They really felt like something, like you knew your purchase was worth it before you even put the game in the system. Those clamshells were also extremely durable, and great for collectors because not only did they protect the contents inside almost as well as a sheet of bulletproof plexiglass, but they've proven to hold up really well over the years themselves. It's not uncommon to find Genesis games even now that are in mint condition and complete. Of course, like many consoles, including some others on this list, cost cutting did eventually set in and many later releases came in thin cardboard boxes. But we'll just forget that ever happened. Number 1. The Odyssey 2. Bet you didn't see that one coming, did ya? Odyssey 2 cartridges are unique and distinctive. They're just the right size and weight to be easy to handle but still feel substantial. And they've got a handle. That handle actually does make them easier to insert and remove from the system. Plus it's designed to lock in with other cartridges when stacking. And the artwork. Odyssey 2 cartridges all have that amazing retro-future late 70s art style that brings me right back to the days when bell-bottoms were the height of hip and disco was where it's at. Like it or not, Odyssey 2 artwork is totally its own thing. You'll never mistake an Odyssey 2 cartridge for anything else. Magnavox had the branding thing down in the 70s. And to my knowledge, every game released by Magnavox had this same look. The boxes are cardboard, but this was probably the first attempt after the 2600's first nine games to make boxes you'd keep for storage rather than throw away, as the Odyssey 2 beat in television to market by a little less than a year. Odyssey 2 boxes are gatefold, like the Intellivision or those early Atari games, with a space to keep the cartridge when you're not playing it. 
They're also put together in a really interesting origami-like way. There's not a lot of glue in use here. The box is mostly just folded into what it is. That does mean they don't hold their shape all that well anymore, but this is a 40-year-old box. I think it's doing as well as can be expected. Most of my Intellivision boxes are in worse shape than this. So those are my picks for the best of physical game media. Now let's take a look at some honorable and dishonorable mentions. PS1 Long Boxes Very early on in the PlayStation's lifespan, Sony was still kind of trying to figure out the whole game console thing. There was no real standard for PS1 game packaging, and some attempts were better than others. The discs themselves were all CD-ROM based, with a black optical layer that everyone thought was neat, but Sony initially couldn't really settle on one case design. Some games actually shipped in the same cases as the Sega Saturn. More on that in a minute. While a few came in these thick cardboard long boxes. These boxes have a really nice look and feel, and hold up well today. If only this had been the standard package design, I would have included it on the main list. There are websites out there for collectors that can tell you what type of packaging each early PlayStation game used. It's interesting, if nothing else. Sega Saturn's US releases. I have a love-hate relationship with these, although most people just hate them. They are unnecessarily large, but they look great on a shelf if you can manage to keep them in good shape. But they scratch and crack if you blow on them too hard. I don't have a huge number of US Saturn games. Japanese games always used regular CD jewel cases. And a long time ago, I bought a new old stock case of real Sega replacement cases. I still have a few left, so all of the Saturn games I haven't sold off look pristine. But it's very difficult to find used or even new Saturn games these days that don't have cracked or even completely destroyed cases. If you do, it will actually add to the price you pay. People pay a premium for Saturn cases in good condition. A little while ago, there were competing projects to start producing new Saturn cases again based on the old design, so you may be able to replace your own more easily now, although it depends on whether or not a production run is going on at the moment. Any system that used standard jewel cases. This includes the PS1, once Sony did standardize, the Dreamcast, the Japanese Sega Saturn, and probably some others I'm forgetting. The 3DO, CDI, any more? Anyway, CD jewel cases were the bane of even music CD owners' existence through the 80s and 90s, so why game manufacturers decided to use them has always been beyond me. Think of them like a miniature Sega Saturn case made out of that same brittle clear plastic. It's actually more common to find these broken than not these days, and frankly always was. I'd buy new CDs all the time that were already cracked or broken just from being transported to the store. It was annoying, and that carried through to game systems that used them too. I will say that there was not one single manufacturer of jewel cases, and some are better than others. I used to think Japanese ones were generally better than American ones, but that doesn't really hold true uh, now that I've had a little more experience. All of them suck compared to any proper plastic clamshell. Sega My Card, NEC Who Card. It was Sega that first had the idea of putting games on cards that were not much bigger than a credit card, and they did this for smaller games on their Japan only SG1000 system starting in 1983. This system would later evolve into the Master System, which is essentially the exact same console as the SG1000 Mark III in a different case. These cards had a limited storage capacity, and not many developers used the format especially given that the system also could take standard cartridges that allowed for more technical and creative freedom. Still, the cards themselves are neat. You could conceivably carry a couple of them in your wallet, but they were not a success. NEC did a little better with their take on the idea, which was the main storage media for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16. And, you know, while I actually forgot to put it in the script, I do want to give a little bit of a shout out to some of the various handhelds that also used plastic clamshells, like the Nintendo 3DS, the DS, the PS Vita. Uh, I think those are pretty cool too. Well, there you have it. One man's nostalgic look back on video game physical media. Hey, some of us just like touching stuff. And actually owning things is always a plus in my book. But let's face it, if the console makers get their way, this is probably the last generation where you'll be able to do that. PC gamers gave it up long ago. You can't even buy most PC games on disc these days, even if you wanted to. 
So while it's maybe slightly premature to say this, may as well get ready to pour one out for one of the most fun parts of the video gaming experience. Oh well, guess that's what retro gaming is for.